So on this Shabbat, I was thinking about something that I received yesterday from one of our congregants who forwarded the clergy an email from the Hillels of San Diego. Its content and embedded video illustrated a disturbing reality that has and continues to plague our college campuses. A toxic narrative of online misinformation or mistruths that has only amplified in recent weeks as a result of the violence in Israel and Gaza. Over the past few weeks, many of us in Jewish professional circles have been engaged responding to this surge of anti-Semitic activity, both locally and nationally. From writing op-eds to countless conversations with many of you and many others in our community, a new evolved anti-Semitism is trending pervasively and powerfully on college campuses, in our neighborhoods, and throughout the interwebs, often in search for understanding and light and insight. I turn to our Jewish text as a guide. This week was certainly no exception. And I found the wisdom of this week's portion speaking directly to the moment in which we find ourselves. This week we learn of a man in our section named Korach, a portion named after him, who challenged Moses' authority. Korach was from the tribe of Levi. He, along with other tribal leaders, had nothing in common except that each of them wanted to be leaders. Each of them wanted a more senior role or prestigious position than they currently held. In a word, they were seeking power. In our tradition, there's a concept called machloket l'shel shamayim, which means arguments for the sake of heaven. And we learn about this concept in Pirkei Avot in the Ethics of Our Fathers in chapter 5, and I truly believe that arguments that are indeed for the sake of heaven are inherently important Jewish values. At first glance, even, Korach's words appear as a just argument, l'shem shamayim. As he says to Moses and Aaron, and I quote, you have gone too far, for all the community are holy, all of them, and Adonai is in their midst. Why then do you raise yourselves above Adonai's congregation? Seems like a logical statement and a just question, that all of the Israel community are holy, and that we as a free society can challenge hierarchy. Yet, this statement and question identify a clear picture of how these rebels define leadership. I believe their very accusations are what they themselves wanted. Korach was not an anti-authoritarian, nor a believer in the holiness of a people. He used the language of equality in an attempt to raise himself above others. His vagueness was not with the hierarchy of power, but rather his position in it. In our text this week, the explicit way in which Korach imbued doubt was by accusing Moses of setting himself above the congregation of turning leadership into lordship. Korach and the rebels made other claims as well. They accused Moses of abusing his power for personal gain, misappropriating per people's property. The most egregious instance of the, is the accusation leveled by the rebels Datan and Aviram, in which they say the following, isn't it enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with halavu devash, with milk and honey, to kill us in the wilderness? This is a harbinger of those modern concepts, subjective news, and questionable facts. These were obvious lies. But they knew that if they said them often enough and at the right time, someone would believe them. Their aim, as we can infer from the text, was to discredit Moses, raise doubts among the people, and damage his credibility, to tarnish his character that he would be unable to lead in the future, or at least be forced to capitulate to the rebels' demands. Korach and the rebels' argument was indeed not, and I say not, a machloket l'shem shemayim, not for the sake of heaven. 
Throughout Jewish civilization, we have been met with various versions of rebellious factions and rebellious fictions. And often, their pronunciations are laden with hurtful disinformation. Various empires throughout history accused Jews of wanting to dominate the world. The narratives of blood libel blame the ills of society on Jews. The protocols of the elders of Zion, invented by rioters and propagandists in Tsarist Russia during the last stages of its decline, focused on Zionist global dominance. These are just to name a few. And in our modern day, those in both radical and extremist circles have fed on these ancient myths to amplify doubt and disdain towards the Jewish community once again. We know all too well that outbreaks of anti-Semitism can be a forerunner of something more pervasive, a signal of a wider disturbance in the soul of society. That's the sense I am sure so many of us here and those joining us and many out there feel from the recent rash of assaults that unfolded in LA, in New York, and elsewhere. Yet, the political context is new. In the past, most of the anti-Semitic attacks in the US have been the product of white supremacists or unwell individuals deciding to take out their pathologies on a group often blamed for society's flaws. Occasionally, there are broader political subplots. However, this latest outbreak was aggravated in direct response to the recent conflict in Israel and Gaza. While there, has been, while there have been political leaders who have denounced anti-Semitic violence, many have been oddly silent about the people throwing explosive devices, about Jewish-owned businesses getting burglarized or graffitied, and shouting expletives about Jews on the streets. Additionally, the rhetoric of other politicians and social media influencers have helped to nourish these prejudices, making this outbreak of anti-Semitism especially unsettling in our day. So, in the midst of all that continues to swirl around us, how do we, much like Moses, stay in the machloket l'shem shemayim? How do we stay in the argument for the sake of heaven? Here are several ways. First, we need to look to Jewish history, knowing that our protection and safety and security never came from giving into ideologies that require us to erase ourselves. Our true authentic self can stand in support of others without erasing the request for others to recognize that their silence or absence has been hurtful. Second, ideas that had their genesis on university and college campuses are now immersed in our mainstream culture. Make no doubt about that. And we need to pay attention and to speak up when we learn of false narratives being spread. It is our sacred mandate. Third, while we have a lot to grieve at this moment, let's work on figuring out how to defend what has been for Jews the best diaspora experience throughout all of Jewish civilization. We need to stand up loudly, and it's not down the road, it's now. Fourth, as American Jews, we owe ourselves the self-respect to insist that our security, our rights, and our place at the table is not something we should ever apologize for, nor is our success in American society. And lastly, as I was reminded from our interview last week with Barry Weiss, the more we can lean into Jewish history and Jewish identity and the ideas that have transformed not just the people but the world, the more we will be able to see what is being asked of us in this moment. Torah is not just history. It is a powerful lighthouse that helps us see through the fog. It is the moral compass for how we live our lives. And in that review, I believe we will come to see that so many others have sacrificed so much for us. And indeed, it is an honor and privilege for what's being asked of us in this very moment. Those on the fringes have always made substantial change, and we all have the potential 
to bring about what's possible. So on this Shabbat, let us remember, those anti-Semites, they do not define us. We define ourselves. And the greatest threat for us as American Jews would be to lose sight of the magnificent power, wisdom, and the redemptive hope inherent in our Jewish tradition. We define ourselves by the depths of our prayers and the righteousness of our actions for our communities, for ourselves, for our children. Let this be God's will and God's blessing as we say together, amen. And as we think about these moments, and I, and I don't like to bring moments of pain always into our Shabbat, but this is not a time we can run away or mask or not talk about what's confronting us head on. It is gravely important that we have the power and the capacity and know what we stand for as young Jewish children, as men and women, and anywhere you are on the binary, to hold up this Jewish ideal. Because it happens through our actions, love your neighbor as yourself. We implore that, and we will continue to do that work, no matter who stands with us, no matter how we hold our, our way in the world, we will continue, and we must continue.